this week, uh, most likely. It was a very quiet, uh, very quiet bunch. Uh, let's leave this. We're ready to get started here with week four. Today we're going to talk about exploratory data uh, analysis, which is where you're going to spend most of your time in 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 data analysis. You know, the plot, the regression model, whatever whatever you're going to run is going to be a pretty quick thing to get together. It's it's all about. Uh, getting your data into the right shape, exploring your data, understanding what's there in the first place. Uh, so uh, let's get let's get started. Here we are on our week on our roadmap. Things have uh, stayed the same this week, so we're on exploratory data analysis, and I still plan to do uh, interactive and animated plots next week, which is a which is a fun one. I've seen uh, a lot of interesting uh, COVID. Uh, animated plots going around. Uh, so, so we'll look to reproduce one of those uh, slick ones next week and, and move on to some special topics here at the end. And along the way, we're going to keep practicing the uh, data wrangling skills you've been learning. And I have uh, a, a little bit of built-in tests for you today. So today's plan, uh, we're going to look at some tips for thinking about how to approach exploratory data analysis. Uh, I'll show you some common first steps that I would do with a new uh, data set to summarize and visualize your data without really worrying about what your plots look like, just trying to get the insight from them. And you'll get some more practice with those deep plier functions that we worked with last time. And our, our markdown output goal today is to output an APA style manuscript with this uh, Papa Jaw, which is so close to Papa John's uh, that I'm going to call it probably the Papa John's package. But it'll put out an APA style manuscript for us in either Word or PDF. All right, that's the plan for today. And our inspiration comes uh, from just down the street, uh, some street here in Durham or Chapel Hill. It's from uh, Kieran Healy, Healy, who is a, uh, a professor of sociology here at Duke, has a great book on data visualization that. Uh, my course version of this workshop is going to take a deep dive into and uh, he, uh, he grabbed the Apple mobility data that you might have heard about that Apple released basically looking at changes in Apple Maps users requests for directions whether you're on transit walking or driving looking at the change uh, from January 13th uh, uh, until now uh, and so we're going to try to make a plot that looks like uh, Kieran's, but we're going to add a few things. First, we're going to look at U.S. cities, and uh, we're, we're going to try to add a, a marker for uh, at, at March 15th, how many cases did each city have. Uh, so similar idea for the visualization, but a few tweaks. That's our goal for today. Last week, we worked on importing data. Remember, I showed you if you have files that are local or on the web, uh, some common approaches you would take to uh, load those into R. Uh, go back and visit last week's uh, video and uh, files if you want a little bit more practice. But basically the message was last week, if the data exists somewhere, uh, we can get it into R and work with it. And we also last week looked at uh, the dplyr package, a uh, member of the tidyverse, and a few uh, key function uh, verbs here that we're looking at. Mutate to create new variables. Select to grab a few specific columns that we want. Filter to grab specific rows, right, to exclude data. Summarizing, taking a bigger data set and making it down to a smaller one. Uh, arranging our data, like sorting and uh, looking at distinct, which reduces duplicates. I, I use these six in just about every analysis. Uh, that that I come across. So these are the ones that I uh, taught you. We'll get some more practice with these today as well. So exploratory data analysis, uh, Roger Peng, who is a, a professor at Johns Hopkins and, and one of the professors that uh, participates in their you know, exceptionally uh, uh, popular data science Coursera courses. They've taught uh, over a million people uh, data science uh, at this point. Well, he has a book uh, on the uh, Lean Pub uh, platform called Exploratory Data Analysis with R. I, I believe there's also a book down version of it that you can get for free or, or you can pay a little bit, uh, whatever your preference. But he has a nice exploratory data analysis book that helps you get into uh, EDA a little bit more uh, in depth, of course, than we're going to do in the next uh, 50 minutes here. Uh, we're going to take some of his ideas. He has a checklist, right, of 
of what are the tasks you do when you approach exploratory data analysis. And, uh, you know, just like I would teach in a research methods class, we we're trying to come up with a question. What, what are we asking of the data, right? So we're going to get our data in. We're going to take a look at what comes in uh, to make sure that everything's as we expect it to be. We're gonna, we can use this STR function to uh, look at what our data consists of. Um, often I look at the, um, the first couple rows and the last bottom rows. That's where you see that things are, are missing or not as you would expect. Demographers will tell you, and I had a great demographer as a postdoc, Amy, who you know on her first day was on my case about uh, checking my ends in my tables, and we're going to do that today. You know, our our cross tabulations of different variables do they sum up to the right number that you would expect, or could there have been a problem in either your understanding of what the data set is or the way the data were collected? Um, in some fields, you would validate your data with an external data source. In, our, in a lot of the cases that I work with, that's not possible. Uh, but uh, these are some good first steps, and, and we'll practice a few of them uh, today. Another great resource for figuring out what exploratory data analysis is all about is data scientist David Robinson's Tidy Tuesday videos on YouTube. I'm going to click play just for a moment here and show how I might go about parsing this JSON data. And I should say, he takes a data set that he hasn't seen before and live streams himself uh, exploring the data set. So you pick up a ton of tips of like how the pros really do it, what small things they do that make their life a lot easier, what creative things that they do, but also all the mistakes that they make along the way, coding mistakes, thinking mistakes. It's all very normal. And I think if you watch a video or two, you'll come to realize that, you know, it's, there's no simple answers when you get into exploratory data analysis. So let me click this off and play but David if, for a minute. At the end, I might mostly be looking at the, um, at the abstracts. Let me take a look also at uh, what does the readme have? So for like an hour, he tries to figure out what this new data set is. And in R... Uh, what I, I'm just going to say, I'm going to pull out the bib entries and keep it as it is for now. He talks through every step that he's doing as he's thinking about it. Uh, so it's really just like a live stream of his mind while he's, uh, while he's uh, exploring the data. So I think this would be a great way uh, to figure out what EDA is all about, uh, to take a look at some of David's Tidy Tuesday uh, videos. Uh, let me show you also, just before we get into the RStudio portion, uh, uh, Kieran Healy also had some inspiration this week that I chose not to focus on because he made it too easy to plot. Um, but he took a look at uh, a nature paper that came out uh, recently that had uh, this really funky Venn diagram uh, looking at um, the clusters of symptoms that people have when they have COVID-19. And you know his challenge was how to make this a better visual, not to use a... Um, uh, a Venn diagram here, and <clears throat> let's see. And what he did uh, was he used something called an upset plot, and I hadn't seen upset plots before, but basically here are the symptoms, um, here are how common each symptom is in the data set, and then here's a look at how common uh, different combinations of symptoms are, right? So the most common um, clustering of symptoms would be between uh, uh, fatigue and anosmia, uh, probably botched that. But uh, a, a slick way to visualize and explore uh, this data set of co-occurring symptoms. So I just wanted to share that with you as a slick plot. I've never seen something like that before. Uh, so let's get into our, our studio this week. You'll find uh, in our workspace, there's uh, the week four uh, assignment for you. Go ahead and open that up. Uh, give you a moment to do that. Uh, you notice it's a little bit different today than in previous weeks. We have a, a longer um, YAML section, a longer metadata section at the top. Uh, before I get too far in, I, I should say we do this every week because our studio doesn't have it built in yet, but clicking on tools in global options, if you want your screen to look like my screen. Okay, well, our studio wants me to start over. That's okay. Uh, but the first thing we can do is change our, our pane layout as we've been doing. 
um, and maybe you've already started that by going to uh, uh, the the tools and then the global options and then there's a uh, an option to mess with your your, uh, your panes so I'll do that tools global options and the pane layout you know I always choose source console on the top of the top on the top right and then only history in the bottom left and it just automatically makes everything else uh, go over there so then yours can look like mine and now we're looking at in files the uh, the week four week zero four the RMD file there's a bunch of other files that this creates today but go to the week four RMD and as I was saying uh, you know our output goal today is a um, APA manuscript so uh, the 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 package that we're going to use the Papa John package or Papa John's when we go to new file and R markdown, if we go to template, uh, you see that now because we've installed the Papa, jo Papa John's template, uh, the APA article is an option for us. And that's basically what I did to get what you see here. Uh, if you're familiar with APA, uh, you know that you have to have a, a regular title and then a short title that goes across the heading at the top. Uh, you know, you could put your name here as an author. Uh, you can put your affiliation number, and your affiliation is going to refer to this list of affiliations down here. Now, I can keep adding affiliation three, four, and you can see here for me, uh, I'm affiliated with two places, uh, Duke and uh, Hogwarts. My son and I just started reading Harry Potter this week, so I, I affiliated myself uh, with Hogwarts this week. Um, and you can say that the you know the first author here is the corresponding author, and what it's going to do is it's going to give you that nice uh, title page for APA that looks exactly what you like what you would do if you were writing this in Word. And there's space for the uh, the author notes about our uh, affiliations, a place for your abstract, uh, your uh, word count if you want to put it, your keywords. Uh, we're going to have a bibliography that that we use. It's this WK04 bib file. I only have um, one uh, uh, reference in there at the moment, it looks like. And uh, just a few other things to note, ab note about the, the metadata here is you know, a lot of times when you submit a manuscript, they want you to put the uh, figures at the end. Well, I, I don't personally like that, so I'm going to say that I want the floats to be in the text uh, where they should be. Uh, and I also want there to be not line numbers since I'm making a draft. Uh, and I could also, if I wanted to make this a Word file, I could just change PDF to Word here, right? And what would spit out would be a, a Word file, but I'm going to keep it with PDF. Uh, the Papa Job package has a, a nice manual to learn how to use it. There's a lot of tweaks you can make to make your document look like what you want. Uh, this basic uh, version we're using today will, will get you a good start, though. So... Um, what we're going to do is uh, get into our, our, our lesson for today, and you see that I'm using uh, the same kind of literate programming that we've done in the past where I have my document heading. This is going to be my introduction section, and I'm combining some uh, prose that I'm writing with my code chunks here. And uh, the, the data for today are going to come from uh, uh, Apple, as I said. They, they released their data on mobility just recently. And uh, Kieran has a package that puts it all together for us, but we're going to do it ourselves so we can get a little bit more uh, practice. So uh, we can click run on this first, uh, the second chunk one here, and it, it's going to bring in this external image, right, of uh, our inspiration for today. This is uh, Kieran's plot that we're going to try to uh, 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 draw some inspiration from and reproduce something similar. Um, we're going to get in the methods section, and so here's the link if you want to check out Apple's mobility data. They tell us a little bit about the, the data. It comes in a CSV file, which we've grabbed before, and uh, everything in this file you'll see when you open up is indexed to January 13th. So January 13th, uh, everything has a value of 100, and then it either goes up or down from 100, right? As the search volume goes up, the values go above 100. As the search volumes go down, it goes below 100. So everything you're going to see is going to be in reference. What's the search volume or the request, sorry, for uh, directions, whether walking, transit, or driving, uh, on a particular day relative to January 13th? 
Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and load the packages and the data that we need for today, right? We need the tidyverse and lubridate to work with dates a little bit. Uh, but I've left you a little bit of a blank here. Um, we need to read in our data. And uh, I learned a trick from David Robinson in one of his videos that if you just put your cursor in between the quotes here and press the tab button, uh, I can navigate to data where it's stored. I can press tab again, and I can bring in my Apple Mobility data without having to write the, uh, write the path in there, which is super slick. I always make a mistake when I'm writing in the path, but if you just have a pair of quotes, uh, put your cursor inside, hit tab once, we're gonna select the data uh, folder by hitting enter, hit tab again, and then enter to grab the Apple Mobility Trends data. And when you, everything else should be ready in this section to run. So I'm gonna run this uh, chunk here and it's gonna bring in my data and now you'll see it here in the, uh, uh, in your environment, okay? So uh, if, if you couldn't figure that out, you can always just t type it, the data file is the Apple Mobility Trends in the data uh, folder. And I've also brought in a few other things that I'll explain as we go, a file with city names, and some uh, a file with uh, uh, COVID data and a file that's going to help me aggregate from the county level in the U.S. up to U.S. cities. We'll come back to that. So we have we have our data frames in the environment, and so as we do every time, I'd like you just to take a peek at them. You can uh, click on Apple, and it'll bring it up in the viewer here, just to get a sense of what kind of file we're working with, and uh, looks like. Uh, we have a um, wide file, right? We have uh, unique units like Albania driving, Albania walking, Argentina driving, Argentina walking, and all of the mobility data by date, January 13th, 14th, 15th. So it's wide, everything spreads out wide. And as I mentioned, uh, all the values on January 13th are 100 and uh, everything else is in reference to the number of requests relative to the 13th. So on the 14th, Albania had fewer driving requests, right, than on the 13th, uh, a little bit more on the 15th. And this is all pretty much pre-COVID for these countries. So what you're going to see is that it really bounces around 100 uh, by weekday, as I think we're, we're going to see. So you can... Uh, you can open it up in the viewer and take a look at it. You could in the console run STR Apple, right? And STR Apple would give us a look at, uh, you know, what exists in my data frame. I have 104 variables, uh, a geotype variable, a region variable. Uh, another n kind of nicer way to get an exploration in the console is to use Tibble's glimpse function. I'm just gonna paste that in the console and uh, it's a little bit more organized. Uh, I'm seeing all of my variables here. I have a lot of dates, so I gotta scroll through all the dates. And I have my geotype, the region, uh, the transportation type, whether it's driving, walking, or uh, uh, tr uh, transit, and I have all my, all my dates, all right? So we can just explore visually uh, what our, our data set consists of. Now. Uh, it's wide, and I've been telling you that we're going to spend uh, most of our time working with long data sets when we do analysis and we do plotting in, in a tidy format. So we need to get this Apple data set from wide to long. And I'm going to rely on you to, uh, to help us with that. Uh, we need to use this pivot longer function that we've seen before, right? So uh, if you remember how to read a pipe, it's saying uh, we're going to take all of this, this is our pipeline, and we're going to take the output of that and save it to an object called apple pie, okay? And uh, so we're gonna start our pipeline with the data. That's where we always start. Our data set's called apple. And we need to first transform it. Now, what do we need to transform? Uh, the piece we need to transform are all these dates, right? All these dates that, I don't know, start with an X. So what we need to do is we need some way of telling the pivot longer function which variables we want to use in this conversion. Now, we could type them all out. There's a lot of them, right? So rather than typing x1.13.20, x1. 
we can find a pattern, right? Um, hopefully you figured it, uh, made a guess here. Uh, all of our variables start with, starts with uh, a capital X, right? So we're gonna say, take all those variables that start with a capital X, and we're gonna take the headings, right? That are these dates, and we're gonna put that into a column called date. The prefix here that we can use as a pattern is X. And we're gonna call the values that are stored inside of each one of those dates, uh, we're gonna call it a variable called index. So we're gonna do that and I can show you here, I can run uh, just from Apple and through the pivot longer without including the next uh, uh, pipe operator. And I can say, just run these lines. And you're gonna see now that uh, Albania appears multiple times even for driving because it has a value for every date. Right, so my, my dates used to be in my headings, now they're in a column called date, and my uh, values are all here in a nice tidy format. Now, but I also need to do something else. I need to create some new variables, right? And so what dplyr function did we talk about last week that is, uh, is gonna help us create new variables? Someone throw it in the chat or come off mute and, and let us know. What function are we gonna to use to create new variables? Oh, it's like teaching a four credit class. Mutate, yes, exactly. We're gonna mutate. So mutate, and that means we're gonna mutate, uh, we're gonna create a variable called date, uh, and we're gonna create a variable called change. Now, we already have a variable called date. What we're gonna do is just modify it a little bit. If you look at the, the date here, R is telling you that this is just a character string. It recognizes this as 1.13.20. It doesn't know that it's a date yet. So uh, we're gonna use the Luberdate uh, function mdy, which is month, day, year, to tell R that this is actually really a date. All right, so we're gonna run that, and we're also going to change, uh, create a variable called change that's gonna be our index minus 100, because we wanna get a nice little uh, percentage uh, so let's run this uh, piece here, and I'll run it so you can see it below. And now we uh, have our long data set as before, but we have, uh, we have um, our uh, date is now a proper date, R recognizes it as a date. And we have our new change variable, right? Which uh, 100 minus 100 is zero. Uh, 100 minus 95.3 is negative 4.7. So there was a 4.7% drop the next day right, in Albania's driving. Uh, so go ahead and run the whole chunk, which will assign it to apple pie. And then in the environment, you'll see we have our apple pie here. Um, I spent too long trying to come up with a, um, a, something to do with long apples, but um, I didn't come up with anything. So I went with apple pie. Uh, we're gonna look at American data, so it, it'll work out in the end. Uh, let's look at summarizing, how we might summarize uh, some of our data in a numerical format. Now, if you ask 100 people to, uh, how to summarize this data, they come up with 100, 101 different ways uh, to do it. There's lots of ways. Mine's a kind of chatty, a verbal way here. Uh, but what I wanna do is um, I'm gonna count the observations of the geotype, which is the walking transit uh, driving, sorry, is the, the transportation type and the geotype, which is whether it's a, a city uh, or um, uh, a country, I think. We'll, we'll take a look but I need to count by these groups. So I need to do something. I almost need to group, group them and then count them. So we need a function here that's gonna group our data set by these two variables. In the chat, what are we gonna use? We need to group them by something. Group by, yes, that's right. Group underscore by. So we're gonna tell the R that we want to look at the apple pie, but we're gonna group it by these two variables and we wanna count. So I can just run this piece right here so you can see that we got something uh, useful and interesting. So we, we have the combinations, the cross tabs here of city uh, driving, city transit, city walking, and then country drive it, transit and walking. We see how many uh, uh, observations we have for each combination here, right? And um, that gives us our overall ends, but let's say we wanna get the percentage 
uh, of this n by geotype or by transportation type. Well, we need to come back and use our group by again. Now we want to group the data just by the geotype, right? Just by city or county, not by transportation type. And when we do that, uh, what we're going to do is now create a new variable called GOP, uh, which is uh, the n divided by the sum of the n's for that group. So basically, it's going to take this n and divide it by the sum of um, uh, this one, this one, and this one, because they're all for the city. So if I run that, you'll see what I mean. So now, you know, uh, if I'm thinking of just the group city, Right, 36% uh, of the observations are driving, 26% of city or transit, 36% are walking. Now I can do the same thing for um, uh, transportation uh, type if I want. I can now group it by transportation type, create a new variable that looks like, uh, that, that does it for transportation. And now I have transport P, so, um, for the driving and the driving, it's 58 and 41, transit 70, transit 29 for city and country, right? So I can get my proper uh, uh, percentages here. Now I can ungroup everything and come up with an overall percentage as well. I'll just run the whole chunk. And uh, if I click forward here, so the city driving makes up 22% of the entire data set. City transit makes up 16% of the entire, right? So grouping and counting are just a very uh, fundamental thing that you're going to do with your data. Uh, and it's good to check and see um, what you're working with, right? Is everything as you expect it to be? And it also lets me know that, you know, as I'm thinking about the impact of the, the coronavirus on um, mobility and, you know, did people stay at home, I'm probably going to be most interested in driving. So now I know kind of how much driving makes up of this data set. Now, this is the tricky part because I, I took away the actual answers and I've left myself more uh, fill in the blanks. And so we'll see if I can remember these fill in the blanks too. Let's say that we want to do some basic plots. We're not going to worry about themes. We're not going to worry about look and style. We just want to plot our data. And you know, the, the, the main variable we're interested in in this data set is this variable change that we created. If you want a reminder of what's in your data set, uh, what, what column names, you can say names and then apples our data set. And sorry, apple pie is our data set. It's our long data set. And so we have the variables geotype, region, transportation type, date, index, and change. Change is that variable that I want. And I'll open up apple pie again. I really want to plot this variable change, but let's look at change by transportation type, right? So if we want to do a ggplot, I'm going to start with my data. I'm going to pass it to ggplot, and I need to map my data set to the plot I'm going to make. So uh, what should we put on the x-axis? We want to look at change, and we want to look at um, uh, transportation type. So what would go on the x-axis in most charts like this? Transport, I think so too, right? Because we have these categories, transportation type, and R will help you out, R Studio will help you out, uh, transportation type, and on the y-axis then we want uh, change, our variable change. And we can want to color this, you know, fill it in, uh, fill in our box plots by transportation type. Notice here the spaces don't matter. I could make it like this or I can make it easier to read as long as I don't make it a, a typo. Uh, the spaces don't matter to R there. Um, so we're going to map our data to the plot and we're going to pass our uh, tell R what type of plot we want to do. We want to do a box plot. Now if I just do this box plot here and I don't run the last part, uh, what happens? So I get a box plot of um, driving, transit, and walking, which is fine. Uh, but I also might want to wrap this by the, um, the regions that we have, right? Because we have all these different regions. So maybe I want to compare. A lot, a lot of what we try to do is make comparisons. So I could type a region here. And let's see, if I run this chunk now, um, mapping the X and the Y, and also um, kind of faceting this out by region, 
Um, oh, it's thinking. Well, it's thinking probably because there are a lot of regions and it's not really happy with me that I chose to do this. All right, so here are all the regions, all those gray boxes. We can't even see it on the screen. I can click that little button right here to make it pop out into a bigger window. Uh, and I can try to resize it to see if on the screen it will uh, adjust and look a little bit better for me. It doesn't really do it. Now I, I can make this plot have the right dimensions for outputting to a PDF if I wanted to or a, an image file. But this isn't helpful for us, right? It's too many, it's too many regions. So what did we learn? That uh, the box plot is an interesting way to look at it, but fastening by region uh, is not. Right, so uh, it's too many panels. So can you do something that would limit us to U.S. cities, right? Because this includes all cities, right? Um, so we have countries, regions, and we have, um, if I filter here, you'll see we have cities, right? So we have Amsterdam, we have all of our cities here. How can we limit this to U.S. cities? Any ideas? Can you start trying something? A lot of Amsterdam. Cape Town, that's not a U.S. city. Well, the tricky part is, yeah, a filter would be the right function to use, but we don't have anything to filter on. Like we don't have a way in this data set of knowing is Halifax uh, a major U.S. city that we wanna look at. So we don't have that data in here. So what we need to do, uh, it was kind of a trick question, I won't do it again, but um, we, we can't do it with the data we have. So um, what we need to do is, my approach was to merge in uh, a uh, data set of U.S. city names. If you open up U.S. cities down here in your uh, global environment, uh, what do we get? So we get city name uh, in the state, um, the uh, some, some FIPS codes for uh, sort of census and plotting, we get their population and we get their density. Um, okay, so this is helpful uh, in that I could now, if I wanted to try to match against, you know, is the name in our data set also in the name of list of US cities. Um, so before we do that piece, I wanna show you that I've kind of nested two functions here. Um, inner join, which is gonna join our apple pie data with our cities data but we have this other function called select, right? And remember, select is gonna select the uh, columns that we want. There's a lot of stuff in US cities that I don't need to be working with. So what I'm gonna do is just, if I run this little select piece here, it makes a little data frame of city population and density. Because I said, take the US cities data frame and just give me city population and density. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna join this to our Apple Pie data on the basis of uh, 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 region, which is what it's called in the Apple Pie data, the variable is called region, and then the cities data, it's called city. So I'm gonna join Apple Pie and US cities um, uh, by region city, right? And I'm gonna go ahead and try to plot that. Um, so go ahead and do that. Let's see what happens, see what we get. All right, I can tell if I'm looking at this that I have some city names I recognize, um, but I also have uh, some that I don't. So what it must be is that there are some foreign cities uh, or regions that share a name with US cities. And I can check that by saying, you know, is the string Vienna in uh, the US cities data set in the column city? And R is telling me, yes, it is, right? So. I, in my city's name, there is a Vienna in here somewhere, okay? So that's why it's not properly uh, filtering for me. So I'm pretty sure that I'm not gonna make a mistake if I first filter the US cities data set to have a population greater than 300,000. So now I've nested one more function in here. So again, if I look at US cities and I filter it, now I get my cities data set that we've been working with, but now it just has big name cities that you're familiar with, right? Um, I can add select onto that and say, select um, these three variables, city population and density, and only give me the rows, only give me the cities where the population is uh, large enough. 
So now I have the three columns that I want and I have just the cities that have a really large population, right? I'm probably not gonna make that mistake again. So if I run this, what do I get? Okay, so this is something I can work with now. I've, without going in and, and typing to say, just give me Atlanta, just give me Baltimore, just give me Boston, uh, I, I've said, well, check and see if uh, we can find US city names in our Apple Pie data set by looking at a file, a data set of US cities of a large enough size. And so it pulled out, you know, hey, we only can look at Atlanta, we can only look at Baltimore, we can only look at Boston, things like that. So, this is, so this is a box plot that looks at the transportation type, right? driving, walk, dri driving, taking mass transit and walking by city, but it doesn't incorporate time in any way. It just takes everything from January 13th up until uh, uh, yeah, yesterday, I believe, and, and it lumps it all together. Um, so what we could do instead is we could filter, right? We could say, well, just give me observations in our Apple Pie data set where the date is uh, uh, greater than or equal to uh, April 4th, 2020, All right? So if I run just this piece, again, you can see that it's going to limit my Apple Pie data set to dates in April, right? So it's gonna keep all those countries because we haven't done anything to get rid of those yet, but it's gonna just give us dates in April. And we're gonna run that same join to just limit down to the join and uh, select and filter to get down to the just the cities that we want. And now we're going to facet wrap by uh, region. So if we try that again, what do we get? Okay, this is a better plot, right? In that I can see uh, uh, it's really far below zero for all of these cities. And some cities are lower than others and some types of transportation are lower than others. This is all April data. So something really looks different in April than when you look at the entire data set, right? Everything's still kind of the mean is around zero in, in all of these. So what we might wanna do is be able to look at this plot by month. We can add another uh, kind of panel or dimension to our faceting uh, to look at month. And to create a variable called month, we can use the month function in the Luberdate package and take our date and say, just extract for me the, the month. And to see what that does uh, in our data set here, I can click over. Um, so this is January 13th, 14th, 15th. So it pulled out that the month is one. Right? Uh, I can also pull out the, uh, the weekday here if I want with the wday function. Right? If I run that, I could also say get rid of Saturday and get rid of Sunday if I just wanna look at weekdays. So now in my data set, I have those two new variables, month and weekday. And you notice that I've filtered out Saturday and Sunday. So now I have a data set that um, is gonna categorize it by month and give me the weekday as well. And uh, what I could do is if I wanted to add another dimension of time to my plot is I could add it uh, down here in my facet grid. And I'm switching to facet grid and not wrap. And what that's gonna do is it's going to give me uh, sort of a columns and rows approach that's going to look at by month and by region. These are quick plots and aren't very pretty, but when it comes up, and I can click this to see it a little bit better. Let me pull it up here for you. So now, uh, make it a little bit wider, it'll resize for me. I have my, um, my regions, my, my US cities across the top, and I have my months coming down here. So January, February, March, April, Okay, now I can see a, a, a pattern here, right? That um, there was some sort of transition happening in March, right? Everything's kind of tight in January and February and tight in April, but there was some transition in mobility happening in March. And that makes sense, right? That's when a lot of the shutdown was happening. So the first half of the month was pretty active. The second half of the month wasn't. Uh, and I can now see that when I break it down uh, by, by month here. And you know, again, I can see some, there's some difference in uh, city and type, right? So now I'm looking at type, month, and, uh, and region, all in one plot. I didn't really funk, uh, mess around with the, uh, uh, the plotting here uh, to make it pretty, but it, it just gives me what I need. So let's try to reproduce this original uh, Apple plot. Remember, this is the one, uh, I guess you haven't seen that yet. So run this chunk and you'll see that this is Apple's plot. 
they're looking at uh, this uh, change from January 13th uh, and looking at it by Germany, USA, UK, and Italy. And they only have four lines. Uh, and so while you could have made a, f uh, a, a small multiples approach and put uh, each country in its own little window, uh, they're not overwhelming, right? There's not 40 lines to look at. And uh, we can color them in a, in a smart way and we can label them without having to have someone look up in a legend what the color means. We can label it directly. So it's a nice plot here from Apple. So let's try to reproduce this. Now, the, um, we have a big data set. And since there were only four things that we wanted to pull out, I'm going to take the approach of creating a little object called keep that is going to hold the, um, hold the names of the countries I want. So if I run this, you'll see I can type the word keep. It's now an object. And it just is a, a vector of names, Germany, United States, Italy, and the UK. I want to look for these values in my Apple Pie data set. So uh, I want to look for them, and then I want to limit the data to just uh, observations where the region is in this list of keep, right? where the region value is in this list keep. So again, what's the function I'm going to use here to limit my data set? We'll take Sage's old answer of filter because it's the right one. Uh, so filter, we're going to filter. Uh, if, you've, if you've run keep, now keep exists. And we'll say apple pie filter to just give me where the countries are in that list. And now I have Germany uh, and so forth. I just have those four countries. Uh, now here I've, I've really made it interesting for myself. Um, we need to do, ah, we need to do something because let's say, I think what Apple is doing is they're only looking at driving data. So we need to also limit ourselves and we know limit, it's going to be filter again to, uh, where the transport data is only driving. All right. So we only want, uh, here's transportation type. Um, we don't want transit driving. We want the word driving. So we want to filter. And you know what we would put in here? We want that transportation to be driving only. Anyone want to take a guess? We need a variable to equal something. We only want observations where transportation type equals, because we're not doing assignment. You're so close. When we do equals in this case, uh, we need two of them. Right? to make it distinct from uh, the assignment equals, right? Transportation type equals equals uh, driving. All right now, if I do this, it's going to limit my data set now down to uh, just those four countries and just only uh, driving data, right? In their plot, they, they don't use the word USA. They use, uh, sorry, they don't use the United States. They use USA. So I'm going to mutate region. I'm just going to change the region variable. If it equals United States, I'm going to change it to equal uh, USA. If it doesn't, I'm just going to keep the existing value for region, right? So in region, if region is equal to United States, it's going to rename it USA. Otherwise, it's just going to stay the region value Amsterdam in that case. Uh, this is a trick for the plotting. Don't worry about that. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and plot now. And uh, if we look at Apple, they have the date on the x-axis. They have the change on the y-axis. And they're doing some line plots by region. right? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to put date on the x-axis, change on the y-axis. We're going to group by region. And we're also going to tell it that we want the coloring of the lines to be by region. And we're going to make a geom line. Right? So I can run just this piece. It's going to give me a basic plot. Uh, and we're pretty close, right? Everything we're going to do from here out is what you would do after exploratory data analysis, right? Because we're ready to actually publish our figure. This is good enough for exploratory data analysis. But if we want to make it better, uh, we would mess around here to uh, change the breaks of the axes, right? Uh, we want to change it to go from negative 100 to 80. We want to change the colors, right? We don't want the legend to appear. We want to take uh, 
the labels and put them on the ends of the lines. We want to give them new, uh, we want to give the plot a new title, a subtitle. We want to give it a caption. We want to take away the X and the Y uh, axis titles. We want to put a line at zero, right, to give our baseline. We want to overall strip down the theme and then we want to do a few things to remove a few grid lines and change the color and the size of our font. These are pieces that you've you've just got to explore and sort of turn them on and turn them off to see what they do. Um, uh, for the most part, I can type these out now. Uh, sometimes I'm still Googling to figure out what exactly can I give to scale Y continuous. I don't remember what all the possible arguments are. Right? So rather than try to teach you each one of these, the best way to learn is to go in and say, if I turn this off and I run it, what happens? If I turn it back on and run it, what happens? So let's run this and see if we get something similar to Apple. Not bad, right? It's not exactly uh, what they have, but but we have a we have a plot that um, re re resembles to a, a nice degree of of what they did for us. But we want to take this a step further, and uh, we want to see if we can bring in some data uh, on um, uh, cases, and we want to look at just U.S. cities. And we're trying to do something that, uh, um, like Kieran did with the small multiples. So we have our case data, right, in confirmed. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this because we've, we actually did this in a previous week, right, where we have our confirmed data. And uh, so it's by county in the U.S., and it's, again, it's a wide data set. So we have our, our increasing case count by day. And we're going to do that pivot. Again, I'm not going to spend time on it because we, we, we did it actually earlier today, and, and we did this same one in a previous week. Um, so we're going to create a long data set called confirm long that's going to shift it from Y to long. All right. So now uh, it has uh, 300,000 uh, observations for all of these, all of these regions. And uh, previously, when I was putting this together, I also was doing this for deaths, but we're not going to worry about that. Just run this last piece so that if you decide to turn on deaths, it'll run for you. Uh, so now we have a data set so called COVID, right? That's the one we're going to use. It's the exact same as confirmed long, uh, but we have 300,000 observations. Now the trick is, and this is why uh, I, I lost the majority of my sleep last night, is because I realized that there was no data set out there that I could find that gave COVID case data or death data by city. Everything's reported by county, which makes sense given how uh, public health works here in the U.S. and public health reporting. It's sort of county level. But we want city to kind of match Kieran's plot to be able to add our case data to that. So we're going to use these delineation files from the census. If you open up the delineation object, what you'll see here is um, a lot of stuff that we don't need. But the point I want to make is uh, we're going to collapse across Atlanta, right? Atlanta has all of these counties, but it's not really just Atlanta, right? It's Atlanta, Athens, which makes up of Athens, Clark County, Sandy Springs. Uh, all of this makes up the, the, the area, sort of the metropolitan area uh, we're calling Atlanta, right? So we're going to sum across for every day the number of cases cumulatively in Atlanta by summing all of the counties that are in Atlanta. So what we need to be able to do to get that, um, you can, sorry, you can, if you want to run this, you can, you can just see it. That's, that's basically what I just showed you there. Uh, these are the values for Atlanta. It's bigger than Atlanta. We need to aggregate our data, right? We need to start with um, uh, uh, delineation, right? We just need the region and we need the FIPS code, right? Which gives the code for the county. So we need like Atlanta by all of the counties, essentially. And we're going to join that to our COVID database, our, our COVID uh, uh, data. And we're going to join everything in COVID except for the region variable because we already have one here in this file. And we're going to join them on county, right? Because I have, I have a list of counties by region. And in my COVID data set, I have all of my data by county. So I am going to uh, join my data. And um, for time, I'm going to run this. And what it's going to do is it's going to group by region and date. So it's going to group now by um, 
Atlanta, uh, day one, day two, day three, day four, and it's going to sum all of the cases. And we did this in a previous week, so um, I am skipping a little bit of the explanation. Um, but now um, my COVID apple is going to consist of um, my region, uh, the FIPS code, the date, and the number of cases cumulatively. And Atlanta didn't start seeing cases until, uh, reporting cases until March uh, 3rd. So now I have a data set that is, is, is uh, only having my US cities and uh, it's now aggregated up to the uh, city level. So let's prep the data set one last time, right? Where we go in and we say, well, just give me the driving data. Um, we're gonna take our Apple Pie data, just give me the driving data. I wanna join the Apple Pie data on mobility with um, my US cities. Just give me the right US cities. Join COVID Apple, right? Where we just um, uh, figured out how we're gonna aggregate. And, uh, and then I wanna create an indicator for whether or not change is positive or negative. So if I run this, you'll see what I mean, apple pie, COVID. So I ran that chunk and now I have Atlanta driving data by date. I have my change variable, right? Relative to January 13th. And I also have a indication for whether this change is kind of zero or above zero. True, 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 false. Here's the first time for my plotting where it's negative. So I wanna plot and I wanna color it by whether or not it's positive or negative, and I can use this new pause variable I created to do that. So I just ran this chunk um, and we're ready to get plotting here. So I'm gonna take this new object I created, apple pie COV in chunk 17, my data is now ready. Um, I wanna put the date on my x-axis as before. Change again is gonna be on my y-axis. But now I want my, the how, R fills in the plot color-wise and how it colors the lines. That's the difference between fill and color. I both want them to be dependent on whatever your value is for positive. If, you're, if it's a true change, if it's true, meaning it's a positive change, uh, I want it to be colored one way. If it's false, meaning it's a negative value for change, I want it to be colored a different way. And I'm gonna pass the geom call because I wanna make like little bar columns that are gonna blend together. And I'm gonna tell it that um, here's where I assign um, uh, a, a color. This is a hex color uh, code. This is a certain color purple and a certain color orange. And I'm gonna assign it to the true and false values. I'm gonna wrap it by region. And I'm gonna put a line here uh, on March 13th. I want a line for each uh, facet to appear on March 13th. And I'm gonna add a piece of text that goes in and grabs the label for the number of cases that each city had on that day. I'm gonna put a line at zero, so it kind of distinguishes what the baseline is. I'm gonna make some uh, nice titles and subtitles, and then I'm gonna theme it up a little bit to make it look like how I want. The pieces where you could go back and dig in to figure out what's really happening in this chart is to learn what geom v line is, where I'm putting a line at March 15th, a geom text, where I'm putting the number of cases on the plot. That would be something to explore to make sure that you, you can play around and change some of the parameters and rerun it and see what happens. That's how a lot of the learning happens. So I'm gonna click that and now we have, if I, if I hit this little button to make it uh, pop out, I'll bring it into your window here so you can see it too. So now I have, whoops, 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 whoops. Sorry, my screen sharing uh, blank there for a moment. Um, So now I have a plot that I can resize a little bit. And I have Atlanta, Baltimore, Boston. I have um, values when they're positive and when they're negative. And they all seem to go negative around March 15th uh, when these orders were put into place, right? People, uh, this is driving, right? So their, their, their maps requests for route driving directions really starts dropping in middle of March. And what I've added to this is for each city, I've grabbed from the file the number of cases that that city had on March 15th and plotted them all together here automatically. And I've given a little shout out to Apple. And what I really should probably add to this data caption is that 
you know, Atlanta is Atlanta plus, right? It's not just the strict metro boundaries of Atlanta, if you were strictly looking at the number of cases. So let's then hit our knit button to finish with a flourish here. When you knit this, uh, it should come together for you. If it does not, what you need to do, if you get thrown an error, what I want you to do is copy this tiny text in line 49 all the way up the top. Copy this and paste this into your console. Run this. And then uh, you can come back and hit the knit button. Uh, for me, I think I did have to do this. Um, I'm not sure since I did it if you'll have to. Um, and when it prints out, because it will eventually, now I have a data, I have a file, and I could, this could have been a Word document, but it's a PDF that looks like an APA style paper with you and me at Duke and Hogwarts, and our author notes and corresponding author, or our abstract would be, um, our introduction, and I didn't float these figures to the end, I wanted them to be right in the file itself. Uh, but you see, I can uh, reference these figures. I can put references in there automatically like we did in the previous week. I have my method section, you know, my results, and I pulled in my uh, plot that we created. And at the very end, uh, we have our reference section. So again, if you have co-authors that prefer to work in Word, you could have, um, I could have changed the output type uh, on this from Papa John's APA uh, PDF to Word. And if I knit this, what's going to pop out is a uh, Word file. So I'll be able to look in my files. I'm not sure if it'll open automatically for me. So I'll look in my files. I'm, you can see over here in the R Markdown tab, uh, it's, it's running. Um, oh, and it's wanting to download for me. And here it comes. And now I have a uh, document that I can open in Word. My computer's slow, so it's trying to do a bunch of things at the moment, but it's, uh, it is opening uh, this file in Word. And it, you know, it doesn't do a perfect job, especially with tables, but it gets you pretty close. So if you were near the end of your uh, time in R and you thought, okay, well, let's, let's now transition to Word to polish this up and send it off to the journal because for some reason they still require a Word document instead of a PDF, uh, then uh, you could make all of your final editing changes in Word and someone could come back and update your R Markdown file. So Word is, uh, looks like it's almost there for me. I should have pre-done this, uh, pre-rendered it for you so you could, uh, you could see it. Uh, any questions that folks have while uh, Word tries to open on my computer? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Earlier, you were able to like um, highlight a couple of lines so that I wasn't able to read it. Where did you go in code? Uh, tell me again, highlighting some lines. Um, you, I think, I don't remember which part it was. So like you didn't want R to read those two lines. Ah. So like you highlighted it and then you went to code. Oh, yeah. And then you did yep. something to... So you can highlight. So like you essentially, put ha like the hashtags in front of it. Yeah, exactly. So you can go to code, and you can do uh, comment on comment lines, or you can uh, learn okay. the keyboard shortcut, which is probably better. Um, and when you run that, it'll put the, it'll turn it into a comment. So R. So you could take big blocks and turn it off, right? Um, the other way you can do that is if you just want to turn a whole chunk off, you can say eval equals false and R won't evaluate what's in this chunk. Um, the default is set to evaluate true, obviously. Uh, but uh, but uh, that should do it for you. And let me see if I might, and here's my Word version of, of our file for today, right? So now you and your co-authors could go in and work in your um, sort of normal process, track changes and stuff. Okay, well, I'll hang on for more questions. Uh, if folks have them, I'll post the video and uh, come up with a challenge for this week. I am teaching this course, uh, this workshop as a, as a course in summer one. If uh, it's uh, interesting enough to you to want to do it again in more depth, we'll go through Kieran Healy's book, uh, Data Visualization and, a few, uh, and other resources. And there'll be a, a semester long or summer semester long uh, project that you'll work on uh, in addition to these kind of weekly weekly assignments. Uh, so hope everyone has a good uh, weekend and we'll thanks for joining and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Eric. You bet. Uh, hi, Eric. 
Hi. Could you check out the code that I just put in the chat? Um, I, I wasn't able to pass this point in the uh, in the exercises because of this prefix is missing error. Let's see. Starts with ah. So <clears throat> go to your starts with, and um, you bet. And instead of uh, having st it starts with is the function oh, and that is yeah. the reason uh and r is gonna say I, I have no idea what you mean i have no oh that's what you mean right okay it, got it got it thank you you bet oh so um but so starts the camel code starts with comes up 